Welcome to the uh, perspective unit of uh, week six, which is also the last week uh, in the uh, uh, NEN to Tetris course. And uh, there are several questions that come to mind about what we did uh, during this week, which was mostly uh, writing an assembler. And uh, the first question that uh, uh, I'd like to discuss is the following one. Can you possibly improve the symbolic hack language without changing the uh, binary code or the machine language which is underlying uh, uh, the symbolic level. So indeed we have uh, uh, two layers of, uh, um, of uh, expression here. We have the symbolic uh, uh, level and we have the, uh, uh, the binary code that uh, lies uh, uh, below it, uh, if you will, and the assembler uh, bridges this uh, difference. And indeed we can take this level, the symbolic level, and make it more uh, user-friendly or more programmer-friendly and there are various ways to do it, and uh, uh, in order to explain them, I will go to the uh, uh, board and, uh, and show you some examples. So how can we make the hex symbolic language more programmer friendly? Well, what we can do is introduce the notions of uh, macro assemblers and macro commands. So uh, let me say a few words about uh, this added layer uh, of abstraction. Let's take a typical operation like uh, loading the D register with a value of some memory register. Uh, it is quite natural to think about a command that looks like this. D equals M, let's say, at 100, okay? Which means go to register number 100, take its contents, and put it in the D register. This would be a natural thing to write, and yet, uh, uh, the standard uh, hack language does not uh, feature such a, such a command. So what I can do is I can take a command like this and translate it into uh, two uh, valid commands in the hack language, which will be at 100 and d equals m. Okay? So this is an example of uh, what is sometimes called a macro command, and I can decide that whenever I write this command, I actually mean that I want these two commands uh, to get uh, executed. Likewise, think about jump instructions. Uh, for example, it will be very natural to say something like uh, jump to uh, this particular label. But once again, in the hack language, uh, such an instruction is not permitted. So instead, I can expect this instruction to be uh, translated into two instructions, which would be uh, at loop and followed by uh, a standard jump commands. So these are macro instructions. These are actual instructions. And in order to close this gap, I have to do something to my assembler. I have to extend the assembler. And, uh, and write it in such a way that whenever it encounters uh, a command like this, it translates it into uh, two machine language uh, commands rather than uh, a single one, which is what we normally did in, in the standard assembler. One question that often comes up when uh, students work uh, on assemblers is that, uh, will I ever have to use an assembler outside school? Well, Noam, what do you think? Well, the answer is exactly the same answer we gave to the question, will we ever need to use machine language that we gave in week four? Very, very rarely. Most of the time, people write in high-level languages and do not worry about the machine language. When they do worry about the machine language, of course, they will do it in assembly language, and thus they will need to use an assembler. But this is very rare, only in the special cases where performance is of utmost criticality. Now, in these cases, sometimes they will only want to focus on a very small part of the program and do it in assembly language, and do the rest in a high-level language. Uh, for example, C compilers allow you to do this kind of combination, to write most of, the thing, most of your program in the C language, and in it, embed a few commands in assembly. So the assembler is sort of part of the C language compiler, and allows you to deal with very specific points of the program that you want to extremely optimize and write them in assembly language. Beyond that, you will probably not worry that much or at all about assemblers or assembly language programming. 
No, this course is about building uh, computers, and uh, we had uh, the tremendous luxury of using other computers in order to build the hack computer. And in particular, when we wrote the assembler, uh, we wrote it using a high-level language like Java or Python or whatever language uh, students have, chose, uh, have chosen to, uh, uh, to use when they wrote the assembler. Those of you who actually uh, programmed the assembler uh, 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 once again used high-level language to do it. So uh, the question is, historically, what happened when the first computers were uh, designed, when you didn't have this, uh, uh, this tremendous luxury? How was the first assembler actually written? So, Noam, do you want to take this question? So this, this is a very mind-bending question. Before I, an before I answer it, I would like to re-emphasize again that conceptually it only holds for the first time you write an assembler. In reality, most of the time there are already computers and usually you use the computers that you already have with the high level language that you already have to write code and assemblers and basic function and basic functionality for the new computer. Now, given that we are still talking about the first computer conceptually in history, how is that done? Well, in this course you also saw that. So remember that the students that are not programmers in this course simply had to compile something by hand. They got an assembly language program and needed to, com to translate it one, one command at a time into two machine language. That you can always do. So conceptually, what you can really do is you start to write a high-level assembler, you write an assembler in a high-level language and translate it by hand for the first time only into a machine language of your computer. Once you finish this translation, which is extremely uh, time consuming, extremely annoying to do, but only needs to be done once conceptually, then now you already have a machine language that runs your compiler or your assembler or any high level uh, help that you want, and then you can keep on using it for the rest of time. So folks, that's it. We're done building the computer. We started with uh, NAND gates six weeks ago and uh, we worked our way through several different uh, types of chips. We built uh, uh, an ALU, a CPU, a memory system. Uh, we've put everything together and we got uh, a fully functioning computer. We added to it uh, an assembler so we can actually program this computer in a, a relatively uh, friendly uh, uh, language and that's it. We have a computer that can run any program that comes to your mind, including of course Tetris. So uh, I'm very happy with this computer. Noam, are you happy with it also? Well, Shimon, uh, part of the motivation for this course was demystifying computers, leaving the student with a clear understanding what goes on beyond this amazing beast called a computer. I think we've only partially done that. We basically understand, I think the students now understand how the hardware works. What is still quite mystifying, I think, to almost anyone that looks at computers is all the different software layers that uh, exist above it. When you actually use a computer, you talk with an operating system, you write in a high-level uh, programming language. It's very far from writing programs in this little assembler that we have already uh, shown. It would be nice, wouldn't it, if we actually had the second part of the course that actually does talk about all these software layers that are above the hardware, the hardware level, that explain, again, in the same manner that we've explained so far, how you can actually construct the different software layers, the compiler and what, what is required for it, the operating system, and getting to a level where the software hierarchy is demystified like we've demystified the hardware hierarchy so far. So thank you, Noam, for this uh, uh, criticism. And uh, uh, luckily, uh, I'm just uh, reminded that we actually solved this uh, problem also because uh, we have a complete uh, second part of this course in which we do precisely what Noam just described. And, uh, and so in the second part of the course, we start with the hardware that uh, you wrote uh, or developed in this course, and we add uh, the software hierarchy that needs to operate on top of it. And then we end up with a language which uh, uh, is very similar to object-oriented uh, uh, modern uh, programming languages. And then you can really write programs like Tetris and anything that you want uh, on this computer and see it, uh, uh, get execute 
on the hardware that you actually built in the first uh, part of the course. Now, how should you go about doing this? Well, there are two ways to do it. First of all, you can get a copy of this book, which gives you everything that you need in order to uh, uh, develop the software hierarchy of the computer. Just like we did in this course, the software hierarchy will be divided into six or seven different projects that you work on uh, uh, each week of the course. So that's one way of doing it, do it yourself. And the second way of doing it is just waiting until uh, the second part of NAND to Tetris will be available on uh, Coursera. And, uh, and then you can just take the course, just like you took this one, and complete this uh, uh, second piece, which is still missing. So with this, folks, uh, the course is uh, practically over. Uh, we hope that you enjoyed the ride. We want to thank you for the uh, time and effort that you uh, uh, invested into taking this course, and we hope very much to see you in the second part of NAND to Tetris. So with that, bye.